Let's close our eyes for prayer. A great God in heaven, we thank you very much for our leadership meeting tonight. Thank you for what we have learned already. We are praying, O oh Lord, that you teach us more in your word in Jesus' name. We pray that the quality you want in us as children of God, as pilgrims on the, on the road that leads to heaven, and as workers in your vineyard, you'll develop those qualities in us in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that your word will have a place in our hearts. Speak to us by your spirit. And as you teach us, help us to be obedient to your word. In Jesus' name, we pray. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about, was so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Already we studied yesterday, now I had the privilege of listening to the study myself, since it came through cassette. And uh, we've explained quite a lot on various parts of that verse, together with verses 2, 3, and 4. But I want to underline and underscore a very important aspect of the Christian life, which is the last part of that verse. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I want to talk on patience in the Christian race. Patience in the Christian race. Actually, if you look at the previous chapter, you will see a list of men and women. And the thing we have always emphasized in chapter 11 is the faith. And that is correct, because those were the heroes of faith. But we need now to understand that we have faith and patience. You think about Noah in chapter 11, and you think about the commandment that the Lord gave him. And you think of the years it took. It required patience, waiting for the fulfillment of the promise. Think about Abraham. And you think about the promise that the Lord gave him. Again, he waited for years. That's patience. How about Sarah? How about Isaac? Going back to Genesis and looking at the life of Isaac, after he married, even though he married in the will of God, it took 20 years before he and the wife had children. Think about Jacob. And think of the prophecy that God had given to the mother. When the mother was pregnant. And think about how long it took before it was fulfilled. Think about Joseph in chapter 11. And think about the dreams that he had. And think of the years that elapsed before he actually got the promise. You think about Moses. And you think about how long it took. He thought his brethren would have understood that God had raised him up. To be their deliverer. No, they didn't understand. In his impatience, he went ahead of God. He suffered for it. But he took time before it was fulfilled. We're talking about patience. And as you look at that chapter, and you come to chapter 12, and it says, Wherefore, seeing that we are encompassed, we are encompassed about, was so great a cloud of witnesses, witnesses to faith and patience. Actually, our human nature is impatient. We don't need grace to be impatient. We don't need teaching to be impatient. We don't need Christian instruction to be impatient. Naturally, we are impatient. And that impatience uh, leads us to various things. But now it says, run the race that is set before you. How do you run that race? You run the race with patience. In the area of worship. When we come to the house of God, we wait patiently in the presence of God. In prayer, waiting for a response, answers to what the Lord will give. We wait patiently. How about in marriage? There is, if there is any area where the flesh leads us, drives us, pushes us to be impatient, it's in that area. And many people are not willing to wait patiently for the will of God. In our family life, as we are adjusting to one another, 
and we're seeking fulfillment in the family life. How oh, we need patience. I but in a childbearing, if we have waited for three months, six months, one year, we will begin so uh, anxious about it, worried about it, and our patience almost is running out by now. I but in a business when we're looking for progress, in our places of work we're looking for promotion. We need to be patient. Actually, without patience, we cannot worship God acceptably. And we cannot live the Christian life acceptably. That's why I'm appealing to the church, as well as instructing the church from the word of God, that we need patience in our lives. When we come together like um, on Sunday, you come and you are patient in the sight of the Lord. When we come for a Bible study on Monday, you are patient in the sight of the Lord. If we happen to have a retreat, general retreat, workers retreat, you wait patiently in the sight of the Lord. And when you come over here on Tuesday, you wait patiently in the sight of the Lord. And the church has not appointed any timekeeper, either for the pastor preaching, or for the person leading the scripture, or the person leading the building the body. We come together and we wait patiently in the sight of the Lord. If we're impatient, we're walking against the instruction of the Lord. Because it says here, you run with patience the race that is set before you. Now without patience, our lives will be turned up upside down. You know why? Impatience causes, number one, disobedience and sin. When we become impatient, you take laws into your hand. You want to grab this and push this and drive this and drive every other thing. You want to hurry everybody up. You want everybody to get into the same carnal, human, self selfish, uh, fleshly nature that you have. It brings disobedience and sin. Number two, it brings backsliding. When we're not patient before the Lord, we want to get it now, get that now. It will lead to backsliding. And what's the use if we say we're worshipping God? And there is a particular trait in us that will lead us to going away from God. Number three, it will lead to self-management. Don't you remember Rebecca, Jacob's mother? Isaac had called Esau. And he had said, go to the a forest and get something I want to eat from you before I die. So I can bless you. And then Jacob's mother felt that we're going to lose the deal now. The promise has been given to Jacob. I have the prophecy. And then she did something which we call self-management. It brought lying. It brought deception. It brought quite a lot of crap. And uh, eventually, they suffered for it. Number four, impatience will bring running ahead of God. God is too slow. The preachers are too slow. The leadership is too slow. They don't know what to do. We know what to do. You run ahead of God. Number five, it will bring chastisement from God. When we run ahead of him, and the thing that belongs to him in his jurisdiction, what peculiarly belongs to him, we take it over. And we begin to run it by ourselves. And he says, I will not share my glory with any man. Number six, the loss of divine plan and blueprint. What the Lord has asked for the church. The blueprint and the divine plan. We lose that. Number seven is the loss of ministry. Might even result in the loss of life. And we think about Saul. Saul in Israel, he lost the ministry. And then number eight is missing God's best. And God will be saying, if you had waited for me, if you had been patient, see what I would have done. Number nine, failure and disappointment. When we run ahead of God, we run without his strength. We run without his grace. We run without his help. And he says, if you think you can do it by yourself, by running ahead of me, you think I'm too slow and you are fast and you can get it without me, okay, run ahead and get it if you can. And we'll meet with failure and disappointment. Number 10 is rejection by God at last. Final rejection by God. That's why we are learning a lesson. It's a lesson we should have learned a long time, but we're learning it over again. That we need patience in the sight of the Lord. And uh, I hope you understand it's my responsibility. If I see the church is going in a direction which is not according to the will of God, and it grieves my spirit, and it grieves the spirit of God, it's my responsibility to call you back as a church, and to say, see the word of God. See what the Lord is saying. 
And I believe that if you are a child of God, it will be your joy to say, Lord, I didn't know that before. I thought I was doing right. Now I've seen the wicked way in which I'm going. And I will go there no more. And then the Lord will forgive everything you have done. And then we'll be able to move on. I come back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. I want to give you some points related, associated with patience. Number one, patience in the race. Patience in the race. We we'll look at uh, verse 1 again of chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing that seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, the witnesses that we have in, the, in chapter 11. And we have, we have no excuse. If Abraham waited so long, what's our problem? If Moses waited so long, why are we in a hurry? And if all those people we have read about in chapter 11, we're not even talking of waiting for hours or waiting for weeks. We're talking of waiting for years. And these are a cloud of witnesses. If they waited so long, if they waited for the promise to be fulfilled, if they waited for God to do what he wanted to do at the time he wanted to do it, if they didn't manage God, drive God, push God, and wanted, if they didn't want God to just finish up and let's go, if they could wait, and we are compassed about with a cloud of witnesses, then we should be able to take the example after all. Why are we learning from scripture? Why do we read scriptures at all? It is so that by the patience and comfort of scripture, we might have hope. So look at that verse 1 again. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. If the sin that is peculiar to you is the sin of impatience, the sin of being in a hurry, the sin of not waiting patiently in the sight of God, it says, lay it aside repent of it turn away from it and seek the face of the lord that he will crush that allow me to use the word that demon of impatience in your life i know it's not a demon i know it's habit i know it's character i know it's sin i know it's a weakness on our part i know it's a terrible thing but let's call it the demon of impatience and then it says when you lay it aside then let us run how do we run swiftly no with patience the race that is set before us so then it talks about patience in the race in james chapter one james chapter one verse four but let patience have her perfect work it's going to take time if the lord is going to do anything you know we who are workers uh, let me uh, give you these words one is to touch the other one is to teach the other one is to train if you pick up those three words and the lord wants to touch you that doesn't take time he wants to teach you that's going to take more time he wants to train you that's going to take much more time you discover that if we're impatient in the sight of the lord all we're looking for is i need a touch but a worker needs more than a torch. A leader needs more than a torch. We who are to be prepared to lead others to the Lord, we need more than a torch. That's why you need to be patient. That's why you need to go ahead and say, Lord, I'm not just coming for a torch. You come to a Tuesday meeting like this. If you're in a hurry, all you want is a torch. All you want is a 20-minute message. And maybe I need to announce to you. That I'm not going to be coming here and be giving you those sermonets that makes up Christianets. That means little sermons that will make up little Christians. We can't deal with that. It will not help us. It's going to destroy the church. And so I'm not planning for 20 minutes today. Neither am I planning for 20 minutes any other time. When you want to come, really come. And so you understand that it doesn't take time to touch. It takes a little more time to teach. It takes much more time to train. And what you are coming for, we don't know what God wants to, want to do with your life in the future. Because we do not know what ministry he has for you. And there is no other Bible school at present. Here is your Bible school. 
That's why we're taking the time now. We're coming back. We're repenting from all our rush and hurry and all our impatience. Now we want to wait patiently with the Lord. And we're not going to just be touched and just be taught. We're going to be trained in Jesus' name. Number two. I gave you number one. Patience in the race. Number two. Patience with righteousness. Now you know if you lose your patience, then you also lose righteousness. In Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one, verses five and six. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience and to patience godliness you will see here it's telling us that whatever else we have righteousness and godliness and temperance and self-control and those good good characters and characteristics without patience is not complete and therefore you must join with the godliness and the righteousness you join patience actually uh, people who are impatient they lose a lot but it will surprise you that it's just like uh, five minutes, sometimes one hour, that makes them to lose quite a lot. Let me show you an illustration, an example of what I mean. Exodus chapter 31. In Exodus chapter 31, look at the last verse, verse 18. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony tables of stone written with the finger of god actually with that verse the lord had finished with moses it was for moses now to go down to the children of israel but the children of israel had waited for 40 days and they had been waiting all along all of a sudden it just came to them now they became impatient suddenly Look at the next verse, chapter 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Oh, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, will know not, will what not, what has become of him. And as to join that with the previous verse, you see that actually God had finished communing with Moses. He had given him the two tables of stone. And he wanted him now to go down. Just at the time he was to come and meet them in patience, searching. It's sometimes like, you know, you are preaching. And all you have left is maybe about 10 minutes. And then somebody begins to feel uneasy. I feeling that ah why are we so long why are we so long and actually we're about to finish and then he does something that the spirit of god will convict him in his heart why did you do that are you going to take the place of the holy spirit is the preacher under your control or is the preacher under the spirit's control what's the matter with you and then you feel guilty and then eventually we round up and then you realize even if i didn't do what i did they will still have rounded up even if we don't round up in one hour, in one and a half hours, does that kill us? Is it not a Bible church? I said, is it not a Bible church? And so, they were impatient. And then eventually look at verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, get, Go, get thee down for thy people, who, which thou broughtest up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. If they had just been way patient for another day, Moses would have come. Because they had waited already for almost 40 days. And so, let us learn our lesson. Number one, patience in the race. This race we're running. The Christian race. Except we're patient, we're going to lose a lot. Number two, patience with righteousness. Number three, patience in relationships. Patience in relationships. Uh, we, we, we relate with one another. And without relationship, uh, nothing can move. Think about it, pastors and members of the church. Think about it, husband and wife in the church. Think about it, the parents and the children in the church. The brothers and the sisters. The house fellowship leader and the people that were leading. We're, we're, we're in a web of relationships. 
And if we're going to do the work of God and enjoy the work of God in our relationship and fellowship, we need patience. And you are going to be patient with the pastor. When you came into the church as a sinner, I didn't hurry up. I taught the word of God. And then you got it, and then you became saved. You, may, you remember many years ago, maybe you were sick, and you came to the Thursday meeting. And we had a long session. And I said, there's one man there. He has this particular sickness. And then I waited. Where is the man? I'm waiting for you. I'm looking for you. Then you raise up your hand. I said, God bless you. Everybody clap. It took time. And then I prayed for you. And then you got healed. And now you are still giving the testimony. It's because we are patient. If we rush, if we are rushed through everything, run through everything, you might not have got what you got. And some of the people that are in the church now, who came as a result of the manifestation of that word of knowledge, who later, after their healing, they became saved later. They would not have been in the church. Now we have come into the church and we forget. Others are still coming. And we need to be patient so we can reach them and touch them. If uh, you had problems with your marriage, when you were still young, a younger Christian, you came to see me for counseling. And I didn't tell you, hurry up, many people are waiting outside. And then you took time to explain. I took time to open the scriptures to you. I helped you and your wife. And we took about 20 minutes to do that. And then it solved your marriage problem. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. And now you are a worker. And all the families are coming. If you hurry them up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. The pastor doesn't have time. There are too many people. Ah, remember. When it was you, those many years, we took time with you and we helped you. Let's take time with them. Let's help them. In our relationships, we need patience. Look at it in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. I'm reading there from verse 19. In your patience, possess ye your souls. In your patience, possess ye your souls. And as we relate with one another, we we'll need to manifest that quality. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Reading from verse 29. 18, 29 of Matthew. It says, And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay them all. I will pay thee all. Sometimes we owe one another. Sometimes we are expecting a brother so and so to do this towards me, sister so and so to do this towards me. Let's be patient with one another. It says we run the Christian race with patience, and we need patience in relationships. Without patience, we get into unnecessary trouble. Genesis chapter uh, chapter thirteen. In Genesis chapter thirteen, reading there from verse eight, Abraham said unto Lord. Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my hard men and thy hard men. For we are brethren, we be brethren. Have we forgotten that we are brethren? You know, sometimes it, it surprises me what I say myself uh, during down the pulpit. And then I tell myself I have to say them. But obviously, the people who are coming for the first time who have never been in our church, sometimes when they hear me on the pulpit, and I, you know, complain about this and complain about that. They will say, ah, deeper lie. Are they fighting with their pastor? Is their pastor fighting with them? See the way their pastor is talking. We forget that we are brethren. And yet I must talk. Because if I see those things that will destroy the church, I don't talk. Then the devil will take over the church by the things that he uses. And then the church is gone. But we should bow to one another. And if there's anybody to bend or bow, I don't think it's me that should bow to the members in the church. I think it's the members of the church that will bow and bend and yield and say, we hear what the pastor is saying. He loves us. He loves the church. He loves the work of God. That's why he's talking like that. And then you will bend. And when Abraham spoke to Lord, and he said, why are we doing like this? Why are we fighting? What was the problem? And you know, it was Abraham that brought this young man out. And then the blessing of God came upon him. And then the, it was the herdsmen that were doing that. Eventually, you know, in the patience of Lord, see what he did in verse 11. Then Lord chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lord journeyed east 
and they separated themselves one from the other in verse 13 and the men of sodom were wicked and sinners before the lord exceedingly that's where he went you know it was impatient he could have told abraham abraham oh you're older than i am you're old enough to be my father I came out with you. I had nothing when I came out. It's through your blessing I had all these. If the herdsmen are quarreling, deal with them yourself. Any decision you take, I'm all right. And you could have waited patiently for Abraham with adult wisdom to solve the problem. But impatiently, he just ran away. And you know what happened to him in Sodom and Gomorrah. First Samuel chapter 13. First Samuel chapter 13. Reading there from verse 8. And he tarried talking about Saul seven days, according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered, in verse 10, and it came to pass that as soon as he made an end of offering the burnt offering, that Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. But now everything is spoiled. Just about a few minutes more. That Saul should have waited. He had waited for seven days already. And instead of still waiting, he said, now the people are scattering. I must do something about it. I don't know why Samuel has done this. He's not kept the appointment. It's not my fault. Uh, it's Samuel's fault. Let's look at verse uh, 13. And Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Can't I say that to many people who manifest impatience in the service? We're praying, they manifest impatience. We're preaching, they manifest impatience. We're calling sinners to respond to the altar call. They manifest impatience. We're training workers. They manifest impatience. Will it be wrong of me to say like Samuel, what you're doing is not right. You have done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. He says, the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. It's important to be patient. Number one, patience in the race. Number two, patience with righteousness. Number three, patience in relationships. Number four, patience under rebuke. Patience under rebuke rebuke there are times we'll be rebuked and uh, it is a family and we deal with one another as in a family at times the the father in the family will frown at the children if they do something that they shouldn't do sometimes they'll chastise them when they need chastisement sometimes they'll talk strong to them sometimes he will withdraw some rights and privileges from them that's family life and when you come to a church, it's the same thing. That when there are things to be corrected, those things are corrected. And I pray that we will never get to the position where we resist and reject and refuse correction, reproof, or rebuke in Jesus' name. But when reproof comes, when rebuke comes, there should be patience under rebuke. In First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Verse 19 and verse 20. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently. That's the word. Patiently. You say you are born again. You say you are a member of the family of God. And you are rebuked for doing something wrong. You take it patiently. But look at the next part of the verse. But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. Even when you think you've done right, everything you ought to do, and then those who see what you have done, that you are thinking it's all right, will judge it not to be all right. And then you are reproved, you are rebuked. There shall be patience 
under that rebuke. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 4. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, but for yielding pacifieth great offenses. When the spirit of the leader or the ruler rises up against you and he rebukes you, sometimes we mention a section of the world or another section of the world, and we openly tell them that they are not doing right, they shouldn't be doing like that. If we are not children of God, if we are not born again, if we don't have God's grace, we'll rebel more. We'll say, okay, you know how to rebuke, you know how to chastise, you know how to talk over the pulpit. All right, go on talking, and we will go on doing what, we, what we're doing. And then you do it again, the pastor comes and says what he wants to say again. You say that, then we do it again, then the pastor comes, and then everything breaks down. No leadership. And the members are not willing to really submit. But when you are rebuked, and you are reproved, even if you thought you were doing well, you will submit. There will be patience under rebuke. Number five. There will be patience before riches. That is, you will not be in a hurry. I want to get rich now. I want to get rich now. Other people have got it. I must get it now. That's very, very dangerous. We're living our Christian lives, and our Christian lives must be characterized by patience. And before we get riches, we're going to manifest patience. Proverbs chapter 28. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 20. In verse 20, it says, in the second part, He that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Be patient. It will come later. In verse 22, He that hasteth to be rich has an evil eye. You lose your relationship with God if you're in a hurry to be rich. Consider and consider it not that poverty shall come upon him. In chapter 20 of Proverbs, verse 21. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 21. An inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. 1 Timothy chapter 6. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and verse 10. But they that will be rich, want to be rich quickly in a hurry, they fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and awful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. It causes backsliding and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Number six, patience before rewards. Patience before rewards. Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews chapter six. It talks about you've done the will of God. You've prayed and you've been seeking the face of the Lord for something. Then you'll be patient. And how many people have been so impatient, they are praying, and because the answer did not come immediately, then they run off. In Hebrews chapter 6, from verse 12, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Not only faith, faith and patience. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he would swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Before you have the response to your prayer, you will need patience. Let's come to Daniel. We looked at Daniel last week. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 21. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, 
I am now comfort to give this skill and understanding. He was still praying, you see. That's what I want. It doesn't always happen that way. Chapter 10. In chapter 10 from verse 2, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the first and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, then it goes on, it was then the answer came. Look at verse 10, behold, and hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hand. And you read on, the answer came. Sometimes the answer comes immediately. Other times, we will wait patiently for days and weeks and months before the answer will come. The Lord is teaching us patience. Number seven, patient for his return. We're patient for the coming of the Lord. As you have believed that we have been saying, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming. And you have been wondering, when will he come? And the Lord is saying, be patient. James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband man waited for the precious fruit of the earth. And has long patience for it until you receive the early and latter rain. But ye also be patient, establish your hearts, and for the coming of the Lord draweth near. We're taking some time today to remind ourselves that we need patience in our Christian lives. Be patient in the race. Join patience with your righteousness. Let there be patience in our relationships and fellowship with one another. Let there be patience under rebuke before restoration. Let there be patience before getting into riches. Let there be patience before response to our prayers. Let there be patience for his return. Patience is indispensable in the Christian life, in our worship, in our family life, in our fellowship interaction with one another. In our pursuits, in our ambition, in our goals, in our praying and fasting, in spiritual warfare, in every area of our lives, let's go to the Lord and say, I know that thing is there. Impatience is there. I want the Lord to crush that impatience from me so that I wait patiently upon the Lord. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. He wants us to be patient. Patience is a quality. That we cannot do without. Our Christian lives will not be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. If we keep on manifesting impatience in our approaches to worship. Approaches to marriage. Approaches in coming here. And we are forgetting that we need training. And training goes beyond just a touch. It's going to take patience. Tell the Lord that you will nail that impatience in our nature. The impatience in our character, the impatience in our habit, he will nail that impatience to the cross. And then you don't want to destroy our church because of your impatience. Let us learn to be patient when we come in the presence of the Lord.